Hi everyone, Mike Malatesta here and welcome back to the How Did It Happen podcast. On this podcast, I dig in deep with every guest to explore the roots of their success, to discover not just how it happened, but why it matters. My mission is to find and share stories that inspire, activate, and maximize the greatness in you. On today's show, I have the honor of talking with Michael Santos. Michael takes us on his journey from working in his father's construction business, which he hated, to becoming a drug trafficker and how that led him to spending 26 years in federal prison, during which time he got his bachelor's degree and his master's degree, became an author, made a million dollars trading stocks, got married, and became a major success. We also talk about why life is not lived in the shallow water. I was in prison for 26 years. I was as ready to come home after eight years as I ever would be. At eight years, I was 32 years old. I had Mm -hmm. a master's degree. I was an author and I was as ready as I could ever be, ever. But I had to do another 18 more years at a cost of what, 35 grand a year? And all that money for what? There comes a time where you have to figure out Are we doing the right thing? I became financially successful, but other people don't. And all that I'm doing is creating this intergenerational cycle of failure. This episode is sponsored by The Dream Exit. The Dream Exit is a private bespoke program for successful entrepreneurs with annual revenue between 5 million and 100 million who realize that they have one chance to get their dream exit right and that the odds of realizing that dream by themselves all alone or at the last minute are stacked against them. In less than 90 days, we teach you how to design, build, and execute a customized dream exit playbook that gets your business ready for sale at its maximum value and gets you ready to maximize your meaning and purpose in your post exit life, even if today you are not ready to sell. You see, dream exits just don't happen. They are the result of early professional and proven planning. So if you're an entrepreneur with annual sales between five and 100 million, and you wanna learn how to 10X to 100X your chances of achieving the dream exit you deserve, go to dreamexitplaybook.com today. Michael's got an amazing story and here it is. Michael, welcome to the How Did It Happen podcast. Hey, I'm super excited to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to a great conversation. Yeah, me too. And this is, I love, so the way I connected with Michael, I I want you all to know, is like, it's one of my favorite ways to connect with people. First of all, I heard him tell his story or part of his story on uh, Jordan Harbinger's podcast, which is something I listen to regularly. I suggest that you listen to it as well. And Jordan, he brings on some really powerful guests and, and, you know, sometimes I click with them and sometimes not. But when I heard Michael tell his story, I was like, man, I really got to connect with that guy. So he's just got something. And so I reached out on LinkedIn and, you know, over the course of many, many months, uh, we weren't consistently back and forth, but many months I had the chance to talk to him a little earlier this year. And, uh, and then here he is today. And you're going to understand why I'm so excited once uh, we get into this. So let me tell you a little bit more about Michael Santos. Uh, Michael is an investor. He's a speaker. He is a multi-time author. I don't even, I tried to count them up on Amazon, Michael, but it's four or five, six books. I don't know. It's a lot. We'll get into that. Okay. Uh, And he's an entrepreneur. Um, He creates learning resources to teach strategies and tactics others can use to become more successful. He has an unusual but well-documented path from struggle to success. Uh, As you'll see, and we'll talk about, uh, Michael made a series of bad decisions during his youth, and those bad decisions led him into the criminal justice system where he spent 26 years of his life from 1987 until 2013 in federal prison. And during his time as a prisoner, he recalibrated, I love that word, becoming more mindful of his responsibility to live as a good citizen while creating a disciplined plan with hopes of reconciling with society, which you'll see he's done in spades. Today, Michael is the director of Earning Freedom Corporation, the founder of Prison Professors, and a real life example of what's really possible when you point your energy and your mindset in a positive direction. So Michael, 
I ask everyone the same question to get started, and that is, how did it happen for you? Well, it happened. I mean, I, I'd love to say it happened because I started making bad decisions when I was 23 and, and went to prison. But the reality, I think, is it happened for me many years before when I was a kid and started to like choose the wrong friends and didn't listen to my parents and um, didn't pay attention in school um, as a young man, uh, as an adolescent. And by the time I, because of those decisions, you know, you can kind of you can look, you can see it better when you introspect and look back. And it's something I learned how to do while I was incarcerated is to look back and say, well, how did I get here? What happened? And I could think of the friends that I chose. I could think of the decisions that I made. I could think of the bad decisions I made and the good decisions and say, I'm really not here because I sold a lot of cocaine. I'm here because I was undisciplined and I lacked a purpose and I lacked draw the, 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 the right motivation. And because of that, when I saw the movie Scarface, it it spoke to me in a way that was different than perhaps other people. It wasn't just a movie for entertainment. It was a movie that said, hey, that looks like a great way to go live. And I then began pursuing that path of finding out what does cocaine cost in Miami? What does it sell for where I am? And how could I put a network together to start capitalizing on that? I was 20 years old, and that led me to a very long federal prison sentence. And while locked inside of a uh, solitary cell, I've already been convicted and I was facing life in prison, I, an officer gave me a book, a couple of books, and that those books changed my life. The first one, I don't remember if it was, the first one was Socrates and the Republic, or the first one was Frederick Douglass, his biography, but those books had a profound impact on me and started to help me change the way that I think. So I wouldn't be thinking about the challenges that I'm facing or where I am or rather, what could I do? And in what ways could I use this time to recalibrate, make amends, and become better? And that's mm -hmm. really why I'm here, is because an officer gave me books while I was locked in a solitary housing unit, waiting to get a prison sentence that turned out to be a 45-year sentence. Okay, so just so everyone knows, this is the time period between when you were convicted and <clears throat> sentenced. So you're in, you're waiting, basically, to hear... What's yeah, the, I got I got arrested be? on August the 11th, 1987. Mm -hmm. And when I got arrested, the only thing I wanted was to get out of custody and get out of prison. I wasn't thinking about the the harm I'd caused or what I had done. I was just telling myself, well, there's no guns, there's no weapons, there's no violence. Um, we're all consenting adults. I didn't do anything wrong. And so I wanted people to see me a certain way. And I had a lawyer telling me what I wanted to hear rather than what I needed to hear. And uh, a jury saw through that and convicted me. Mm -hmm. And it was after that conviction, but before I was sentenced, that my life changed. So I'd already been in custody for about a year when that okay. happened. Okay. Okay. And you, you're living in Seattle, I believe, at the time that you saw the movie. You were working, yeah. for, your, working for your dad. And... I think people are probably listening and they're like, okay, so you saw a movie and that was enough of a catalyst. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To, to essentially learn from scratch. I, 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 you make it sound and it probably is learn from scratch, how to, uh, find by traffic, you know, all these things with, cocaine how well, here's here's how that happened yeah like it was i was driving down the road i remember and I, my dad had a construction company mm -hmm. and i worked there and i and i hated it because i was i wanted to be with my friends who were all out doing fun things and i was you know digging trenches or driving a backhoe or something and it you know with the wisdom of a 20 year old wanting what i don't have instead of being happy with what i do have or building a pathway to what i could create it's wanting what I don't have. And the movie came on, the advertisement for the movie came on in 1984 or so. I think I was 20, so it was 1984. And 
I, I, the accent that Al Pacino used it was a Cuban accent, and it was really good. It sounded a lot like my dad. Mm. <laughs> my dad was escaped from Cuba, and so it sounded like my dad. And I said, "That dude sounds like a Cuban." And they didn't say he sounded. They didn't say he was a Cuban. It just sounded like a Cuban. <laughs> and so I went to see the movie, and I just thought, "Man, hot chicks, fast cars. What? What's not to like? <laughs> How do you do that?" And I called, and I remember picking up the phone and calling this other guy that my dad escaped f- with from Cuba, and he lived in Miami. So I said, well, if you live in Miami, you must know people that sell cocaine. What's the price? How, how does that, you know, how much does that cost by, you know, by the kilo? And I said, you must know that he said, yeah, of course I know people. I went to high school here. <laughs> so he tells me the price of a kilo. Then I remember having the guy who cut my hair, he used to use cocaine. And so I mm-hmm. said, well, if you use cocaine, you must buy it. Find out what that guy will pay for it. And so I'm doing my market research, never contemplating this is against the law. You know, this is, you know, I can get in serious trouble. I'm just trying to say, well, how does this work? And I find out, oh, I could buy kilograms of cocaine for 20 grand in Miami and sell them in Seattle for 50 grand. And I said, geez, that I can get somebody else to go pick it up and drive it across country. And I don't do anything. And that's how I saw it at a 20 year old. And so I, I did not see my bad decisions. I only saw this looks like a fun way to live. Right. And it's how I got in trouble because I, I went in and, you know, as the judge said, I didn't walk down that path. I ran down that path. <laughs> it got, it came with a very serious consequence. And how did you like fund this? I mean, you, you said so, 20,000 so a kilo. I, I told a lie to my father. Mm-hmm. My father, you know, loved me and trusted me and, you know, gave me a, a lot of authority in his company. And we were dirt, we were highway contractors. He, you know, he was an ele- electrical contractor and he put street lights up and signage on freeways and things okay. of that sort. And I told him, hey, when I found out how much it costs and how that I would need some capital, I told my dad a lie. I told him there's a company that's going out of going out of business and they're having an auction in for all of their equipment. I said, why don't I take a hundred grand and make them a cash offer and see if I could buy this before the auction so he won't have to pay the auctioneer? And my father just, you know, trusted me and mm-hmm. didn't, you know, think at all. So I went to the bank and I pulled out a hundred grand and took that cash over like it was like a weekend and bought. Uh, I remember it was three kilos, I think was the first deal and um, turned the hundred grand into like, I don't know, 140 or 130 in like two days. And (laughs) it was just, uh, it it, it avalanched from there. And then um, I went into this in a big way and uh, it got me into a lot of trouble. Hmm. And when you went to your dad with this sort of false request for the money, I, 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 I just like to get inside you know, people's head. Cause I've made a lot of bad decisions in my life too. And I'm when it, 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 it often doesn't feel like a bad decision when you're making it. It seems very practical, very. Exactly. It seems practical. And that's what it felt like. Well, that's what I deluded myself into. I used to, okay. you know, I recognized, okay, there's going to be a little pain here. I'm going to cause my family a little pain. But I was, I remember having this number in my head. I said, well, if I could do this for a year, I could probably make a couple million bucks and then I could make amends and make everything right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I just lived this series of lies from that first transaction. Because once you make it, do it one time and you make, you know, 30 grand or whatever I made and you're 20 and that's like all the money in the world and you realize, geez, I could have made 300 grand, you know, if I had more. Um, and that's a lot of money in 1980, you know, or 87, 80, no, this is like 84. Right. right? So it was a tremendous amount of money. I mean, put that in perspective, you know, a 911 SC Porsche cost like 30 grand back then, 35 grand. So I said, geez, I just made a new Porsche this weekend. (laughs) Chicks are coming. (laughs) (laughs) And then I deluded myself into believing that if I don't do, if I'm not the one that's picking it up or transporting it, I'm not really breaking the law. So Mm -hmm. I would hire other people to do it for me. And that, of course, exacerbated my problems. Um, And I moved it. I told my parents I was going to work for my girlfriend's father. Total lie. And 
moved to South Florida and just lived a life for like a year and a half until I got caught. Well, until other people started getting caught around me. And when they started getting caught, I realized I'm in trouble. And I, and I um, hired a lawyer and the lawyer told me what I wanted to hear and not what I needed to hear. And I just <laughs> proceeded to keep digging myself in deeper because I had some cash at that point and I wasn't really to do, willing to do the right thing you know, to accept responsibility and say, hey, I made a cr- cr- horrific decision with my life. I'm only 22. And, you know, I just used to tell myself I didn't really break the law because I didn't yeah. have any weapons and nobody got hurt and we we're all consenting adults. I mean, that's the wisdom of a 20-year-old or a 21-year-old, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I just did not see the totality of my decisions and how it influenced other people. I only saw myself. And... uh and I proceeded to make a lot of bad decisions until a jury convicted me. And rightfully so. I was guilty. And you, yeah, it's as you describe it and, you know, kind of what the 20 year old mind is like, it seems like you were kind of saying to yourself, well, I'm, I'm really in the brokerage business. I'm not really, I'm not a manufacturer and I'm not, you know, I just, I'm a middleman. I'm just facilitating transactions, like you, you said, know, between the it, will. It, yeah. it, it was a different era. Mike, you look a little younger than I am. And and so it was a different era in, 19, in the mid 1980s. This was when Ronald Reagan was in the White House, and it was before this whole campaign began called the War on Drugs. Hmm. And at that time, there was a, a a hint of glamour to cocaine. You know, there was no crack epidemic yet. Um, cocaine was like for sexy people, cool people, the clubs, and 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 and, and so yeah, I that's who I wanted to be. <laughs> yeah, and so I'm trying to live something that I'm not, and um, and uh, you know, so you you tell yourself what you want to believe rather than reality, and and I just dug myself deeper and deeper and deeper into trouble, and and then when I got caught a year and a half later or so. I I wanted to get out and I didn't want I didn't want to get out the responsible way. I just wanted to get out. I wanted to pretend it didn't happen. And it did happen. And I did break the law. Yeah. And a jury convicted me and rightfully so. You know, and so that's why I went to prison. Did you you, you mentioned your lawyer and the advice um I think that the lawyer was if I'm reading between the lines was saying, "Hey Michael, we can get we can we can win this." We can get you off of this. I'm not sure if that's what it was or not, but it sounded like there was some sort of false hope, uh, or maybe he wasn't like, "Hey, you have to tell the hundred percent truth." Well, let's here. let's let's let you know. You can break that down, right? Yeah. And that and, and and it's we have to you know like assess who is the lawyer, right? The lawyer is a businessman, and the lawyer has one thing to sell, and that's time. Some mm-hmm. lawyers, hopefully, are going to be honest and and fight valiantly and counsel you and guide you on what you don't understand. Other lawyers are going to try and get a sale. And I was a sale, an easy sale, because he could tell me what I wanted to hear. And he said, you know, there's a big difference between an indictment and a conviction. Well, it turns out that's really not accurate. (laughs) Mm -hmm. There's not a big difference in the federal system between an indictment and a conviction. If there's an indictment, a conviction is generally going to follow. And he would tell me that with, you know, with the right amount of money, you could win. And that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Well, I've got some money. Let's go win. (laughs) And, And so that's not a good counselor. Right, a good counselor would say, "Look, you're 22 years old, 23 years old when I got caught. So you're 23. I mean, I retained him when I was 22 before I got caught, and he should have told me you're on a bad path and you're going to prison. You know, you haven't been caught yet. Let's go cut a deal. Let's get your life back in order. It's gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna probably have to give him back some money, and maybe you'll do five years in prison or three years or seven years or something, but." It's time for you to go to college and make things right and put this behind you and start the next chapter of your life. Right. But instead, he told me with the right amount of money you could win, and that's all I wanted to hear. Because I told him I would plead guilty. When I did get caught, I said, look, if you want me to plead guilty, I'll plead guilty. If you want me to go to trial, I'll go to trial. The only thing I didn't want to do was testify against somebody else. And so I said, I need your guidance on what I should do. And, and he was telling me, you know, you've got to stay tough and stay strong and we're going to beat this at trial. And it was just the stupidest thing in the world. I mean, first of all, you've got to think about the lawyer, right? The lawyer is, you know, he is a, a professional and he's got so much time to sell. And if he sees a kid like me that's green and has some cash, he took it. Okay. And, and I don't begrudge anybody but myself for the bad decisions that I made. Right. And then you think about the jury, right? Who's on the jury? 
right? They're typically nurses and teachers and firemen and postal workers, you know, and those are very clinical minded people. And when they say this kid's 23 years old and driving Porsches and cigarette race boats and living on the ocean in Miami and I think he's guilty already. Right. Yeah. We don't, we <laughs> don't really Cuban need to hear much more. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, you're just not thinking things through when you're yeah. that young and that's who I was. And that led to, well, it led to who, why I'm here. Yeah. Right. That's why I'm here for you. Cause I went through that period of time and then I'll always live in gratitude that an officer gave me a book and that book helped me see things differently. And and it it caused me to start. I better figure out a way to make amends and reconcile with society and 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 build a better life. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Were you? It's sort of a dumb question, but did you repay the hundred thousand to your dad? Oh yeah, like in three days. Okay, so it was sort of like yeah. Okay, all right. That so that. I mean, I, I got back, it. I put up a hundred and I probably got back a buck 40 or something. And then by the time I had credit and I didn't need his money anymore. And yeah. And then we sold a lot of kilos and that was the journey. And the move, uh, the move from Seattle to, to Florida, what like, just helped me with the business part of that. You set this up so that you could get material and move it to Seattle. Well, I mean, to... I wanted the lifestyle, right? Okay. I mean, Miami so Vice, I wanted the race yeah, boat, yeah, I yeah. wanted the chicks, I wanted I wanted Miami. <laughs> and I didn't want to work. And I didn't want to be in the backyard of my parents. Yeah. So okay. that was a good spot to be. Hmm. And when you had this realization that you know some of your friends were getting caught and you know, you could see the writing on the wall, you said you retained the lawyer before you uh were indicted before they even, before you were even talked to, I guess. That, that Long was, time, a year before. Yeah, that was, that seems pretty smart. Like that seems like a, a smart thing to do, even though maybe the lawyer yeah. choice didn't turn out to be. I, I learned that from Michael Corleone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right from the Godfather. Right from- <laughs> you gotta have a lawyer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> I hired a lawyer to really help me figure out next steps because mm-hmm. you know you have money and yeah. you got to figure out what do I do with this money how, how am I going to put this money to work you know <laughs> i mean it was just a totally corrupt mindset of a 21 year old 22 year old that is living a delusion and not thinking about the broader society at all is only thinking about his own selfish pursuit of a fast fun life with no consequences just the fast None. fun, no consequence. Right. No, I life. didn't see any. I mean, I, right. I did not yeah. I did not see violence. I did not see gangs. I did not see the things that are associated with drugs, and particularly the quantities that I had a role in distributing and how many, you know, people struggled with addiction. I just saw um, you know, bags of cash and said, cash. This is mm-hmm. awesome. <laughs> and it was just a very bad path for a young man. When you, um, well, let me ask you this first, this, you went to trial, obviously you already talked about being, getting uh, convicted on all the charges. Were you offered a plea agreement that you rejected? Well, that was a, no, I did not. I did not get offered a deal. The prosecutors offered a deal to my lawyer and he turned it down without telling me that was an appealable issue. Um, but it, but it didn't matter because I would have done whatever he told me to do. So you know, and he was going to tell you what he was going to tell you. He yeah. was going to tell me, well, he couldn't have gotten, I mean, I paid right. him 600 grand in 1987 money. So that was a lot of money. He he wanted that money. And if I pleaded guilty, what's he going to get? 50, a hundred, right. you know, and I was in custody and I was vulnerable and I just made really bad decisions all the way through until after my conviction. Okay. So one more question, and then I want to get to the post. Um, your parents, so this happens, you're in jail. What's the conversation like, the first conversation like with your parents? I'm not guilty. <laughs> okay, so you're you're playing that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, this is, this is terrible. They're just doing this because I'm half Cuban. <laughs> I mean, it was okay. just awful, you know, and they're crying and, and, and wanting to, um, wanting to tell me, 
please, you know, let's do the right thing. And and I'm saying, this is you know, on the prosecutor side. I didn't do anything. This is just awful. They're just doing this because, you know, I, I mean, I lied, 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 lied. My grandparents quit talking to me. It was an awful time in my life and and in my family's life. And all because of the reckless decisions that I made. And the lying. What, so when did the lying stop? Did the, what, like, when did? After, this... after I read Socrates. Okay. I mean, I read that book and I'll always remember reading that book, The Republic, and realizing I've got to stop thinking about myself and I've got to start thinking about the broader society. And, and I remember, um, it was very profound because I, for those of your for, for those in your audience who don't know that story, he was in jail, Socrates, because it was against the law to teach people from a lower class at that time. And he was convicted and they sentenced him to death. And the the story that changed my life was called the Crito. And it was when his friend, whose name was Crito, came to visit him in the jail cell. And he told, Don't worry, Socrates, you know, you've been sentenced to death, but everybody wants you to go on and live your life. So they're gonna the jailer's gonna open the gates and you're gonna get out and 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 go live for free and and have a wonderful life and they're gonna support you in exile and um that'll be fine. And, and Socrates says, no, I'm going to stay here. And Crito said, what do you mean? Why would you stay here? You're going to mm-hmm. die. And he said, yes, I'm going to die. He said, but why would you do that when we've gone all the trouble of changing you? And Socrates, as I remember it, said, you know, because I live in a democracy. In a democracy, I got to take the good with the bad. And this society has clothed me and fed me and protected me from foreign enemies. And, and I've taken all the good. But in a democracy, I've got to change the laws I don't agree with. I don't have the right to break laws. And I broke mm-hmm. the law. And I'd rather die with my dignity intact for something I believe in, teaching people, rather than running away like a coward for a problem I create. And I remember when I read that, I put that book on my chest and stared at the cell above me and and just um, and and said, "Well, I've really messed up my life. Mm-hmm. I got to do better. I got to figure something out." You know, and I was already I've been in the hole for a year, so I wanted something better, and now I knew I wasn't going to get something better. I, I'd gone to trial. I lied on the witness stand. I committed perjury. I made every bad decision a kid could make. And that was the end. I said, okay, this is where I'm going to change my life. And this is where I'm going to draw a line in the sand. And, and I wrote a letter to the newspaper and they'd been covering me, my case. And I said, you know, you, you, you've written a lot about my case. And if you want to know the story, this is I'm going to tell you. And, and then the journalist came out and I, and I explained, I, I made a lot of really bad decisions and I'm guilty and I wish that I had done things differently. But I'm going to use all my time in prison to find a way to make things better and to make amends. And I don't know how, but when I get there, I'm going to figure it out and I'll find a way. And you know, Socrates kind of gave me that path that you've got to have a plan. And that plan for me was to stop thinking about my own problems and think about people like you and your listeners and say, is there anything, anything at all that I could do while I'm in here that would cause people to see me differently? Hmm. And, and, and there's an answer to that. And that's yes, probably so. What is it? Because <laughs> you're not going to get that answer from the prison system. So you've got to introspect and figure it out. And, and I came up with this three-part plan. It says, okay, people will want me to get an education. If I can educate myself, people will see that I don't want to be a criminal. Because you can't fake that. And two... I got to find a way to contribute to society in some kind of meaningful, measurable way. And three, I've got to find a way to build a support network. If I could get people like Mike to believe in me, maybe somebody else will believe in me. If I could get Jordan Harbinger to believe in me, maybe Mike will believe in me. Then if mm-hmm. Mike believes in me, then somebody else will believe in me. And so it's that pattern that really guided me. And that became my compass all the way through the 9,500 days that I served in prison. Hmm. And and uh, and it's still what I live by today. Were you surrounded by anyone else in the prison environment that thought similarly, that kept you sort of? Because this, what you just described, sounds amazing, and I know you you actualized it, um, which probably a lot of people don't actualize it. They have it, it's sort of a fleeting thought, perhaps for them, but it's lonely. And I'm wondering, it sounds lonely. So I'm wondering, were there people, did you have a club? Did you have a network or to, you know, I had obstruction, (laughs) Obstruction. a lot of it. (laughs) 
you know, but I had, I had a commitment. And when I was inside of that environment, you know, I was in the most violent federal prison in the nation at that time. And uh, I needed to find my way and stay on my path. And I found a lot of mentors in books that I read, you know, and I'd read about people and they'd kind of like become mentors to me, even though I wouldn't talk to them. And then I would reach out and bring mentors into my life. So I'd write letters, unsolicited letters to people that I wanted to learn, that I wanted to help me. And, you know, I, if I read about somebody that was interested and in, interesting to me, primarily they were from academia, professors. Mm -hmm. That's who was, I mean, you send out, I used to say, you know, you got to send letters out when I'm teaching other people. I said, you know, if I send one letter out, you know, you're probably not going to get a response, you know, but if you send 10 letters out, what happens? You got a 10 times better chance of not getting a response. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> not a 10 times better <laughs> not, getting a response. not getting a response. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you send a hundred letters out, maybe you do. And and that's what I had to do is I had to send a hundred letters out to get one response. And and that helped a lot. And and meant professors came to visit me and they would become my friend. And I wrote to them and developed correspondence with them. And that helped me through like the, the first phase of my journey and then toward the latter phase. I knew I was going to be in business and I started reaching out to business leaders and trying to build connections and relationships that way. And I built a whole life in prison. I even got married in prison. So you, mm -hmm. know, you can build anything, you know, if you're willing to be persistent and to persevere and to do hard things. Yeah. Okay. So you, you, I, let's dig into this a little bit because I think there's something really valuable here for people who are uh, not in prison and people who are in prison. When you made this decision that you were going to become the person that you really are or the person you were meant to be and you needed help, you wanted to reach out to people, how did you decide who the people would be that you first reach out to, these first 10, these first 100, whatever? Because, you know, you told us that you you really – didn't apply yourself in school. So I'm thinking that, you know, a lot of, a lot of these people may not have been super well known to you. I, I don't know. So, um, so you're in prison. Remember you're blocked off from the world. Yeah. Okay. And you've got to find a manner to create meaning in your life. Mm -hmm. And I found that by reading. And if I read an article about somebody you know, I didn't even, might not even know how to write them. I would just, you know, John Diulio is an example. He was, he wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal called Let Him Rot. <laughs> that was the title of the article on the back page on that, you know, that on that first section of the back page, they used to have those editorial sections. And there was a big piece on there called Let Him Rot. And he was a professor at Princeton. And it was a story of saying, you know, we need to build more prisons and lock more people up and, and they should serve longer sentences. And this is like early 1990s. And I just wrote a letter to Princeton. I had no idea if it'd reach him. I just said, mm. dear Professor John DiUlio, Princeton University, Princeton, New Jersey. And it got to him. And in the letter, I just basically told him why I disagreed and thought that we should invest in people and, and open educational opportunities. And, and that would be a way better approach than just locking people up. And that led to a correspondence and a friendship. And he even brought a class from Princeton students to the prison where I was and allowed me to teach them one day. So you build these relationships. And um, and then, you know, I, I was studying prisons. So I developed relationships with some of the leading penologists in the nation. And that really just helped me along the way. Okay. Did you yeah. change the professor's mind? I think so. You know, I changed yeah. a lot of people's minds. At least about you, yeah. Yeah, well, okay. about the system. I mean, I've been very active in trying to bring awareness to what we as a nation can do to improve outcomes for people in the criminal justice system. And I do a lot of work on that. That's really um, a ministry for me to try and open opportunities that will lead more people to come back from prison successfully. So what you did, Michael, the, the you know, the letters and then you, you subsequently or maybe at the same time you got your college degree, then you got your master's degree. You were on a PhD track, I think I saw, and 
something had something the prison system interfered with with that for some reason but is tell us a little bit about that and is that path and this is pre-internet you mentioned i think you mentioned that before Mm -hmm. is that path available to everyone or was there something exceptional about you that created that path for you where it wasn't for everybody it was not available for everyone else i think that every human being has opportunities and we all have choices to make and anybody can make choices that will put them on a path that will every choice we make puts us on a path and that path can lead us to more opportunity and more success or it can keep us mired in struggle you know, I don't remember that quote from Shakespeare, but I write it a lot about, you know, there's a time in the affairs of men that taken at the flood, your life goes on to fortune. Omitted, you miss that path, and you live your life in the shallows and misery forever. And that's just reality. I mean, you know, every human being can look back, but it starts with that ability to look back and say, how did I get here? Well, in prison, unfortunately, when you're separated from the people you love and the people who love you, it's easy to lose hope. And when you lose hope, it's very easy to blame others and just to focus on the immediacy and the stupid things like who's controlling the television show? You know, where am I going to sit on movie night? Okay. And and all of these things have zero influence in your future. Right. But if I focus on what books I'm reading, how do I turn words into sentences and sentences into paragraphs? How do I educate myself on the way the world is changing? And in what ways can I participate in that? You are building a pathway to empowerment and personal accountability. And that is how a person restores confidence. And it's how a person overcomes the the crisis. And all of us go through crisis. My crisis just happens to be I was in prison for 26 years. Mm-hmm. My specialty is how to break through a crisis and and create opportunities out of out of struggle. And so, and that that creation process though starts with something, right? So I think it starts you, with this ability to be ruthlessly honest and introspect honest. because okay. it's it's super easy to want to blame external forces for who we are and where we are and why it's not my fault and who's to blame. And geez, you know, if um, we had a different president or if interest rates were this, or if I, you know, if this person didn't do that, you know, and I just think we're stronger when we focus on what can we do? Yeah. Given the circumstances we're in, what can we do? And that's how we empower ourselves and reach the next level. I have a saying that I I did not make this up, but I I love it. And it's a chapter in my book and it's called your future is your property. Meaning your future is essentially what you choose to make it. And it's not, it, it's not the government's future and it's not your neighbor's future and it's not your cellmate's future or your business partner's future. It's your future. And that, as you were telling that, that, that seems like it connects kind of that because you're what, what I think you were saying is the opportunity is there. The question is, do you have the right mindset? To get started on it and then you have the right mindset or the disciplined mindset to continue on it because it's going to be hard and it may be easier to just just like in life like the shallow water the shallow water might just be easier to feels better to just stay in the shallow water i mean at least i know what i've got and i can complain about it but it also feels kind of comfortable and i just i'm willing to hang out here i think a lot of people fail to really embrace that concept that uh, that I can write the next chapter of my life story. And I can start anytime. It's never too early. It's never too late to start mm-hmm. sowing seeds for a better life. Okay? Never. I mean, right now there are people saying, geez, I could have bought Bitcoin at 18,000 last year. Well, you could buy it today for 51. Okay? <laughs> I mean, there's a th- person that's going to say, geez, I really missed the boat on NVIDIA, man. I mean, it's gone. It's 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 gone forever. Really? Are we at the end stages of, uh, of artificial intelligence or are we at the beginning? That's the strategy of prison, right? Why was in prison before there was email, before there was text messaging, before there was internet? Right. And I had to figure out how do I learn all of that? in an environment where I don't have access to it. And it, it it opened so many opportunities for me. I had to learn about the stock market 
while I was in prison because I felt, well, if I could understand how to value companies or understand, you know, price to earnings multiples or growth rates or, you know, debt to equity or any of these kinds of ratios and understand how companies are valued, maybe I'll be more successful in persuading Mike to invest in me, you know, and I'm going to launch something. And Mike, I learned how to do this here. And here's why I'm going to bring value to you. And, uh, you know, and I got to convince you. So either I can invest in myself and figure out how am I going to learn to really disrupt how Mike sees me? Yeah. Because Mike is going to have a normal proclivity to see me as a guy who sold Coke and went to prison. But if I can flip that script and say, this guy could bring, he, he could stay motivated. He can help my team. He could uh, bring resources. He could, you know, that is the world. How do we bring value to the lives of others? You know, what does Zig Ziglar say? If you can teach other, get other people what they want, you can get everything you want. You can get everything you want. (laughs) And that's just life. Some people get it. Some people have a lot of excuses. I mean, you can't believe how many people tell me you were lucky. And I said, you're damn right I was lucky. I got 26 years in prison. I was so lucky. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's unbelievable, right? How many people will say that instead of looking at themselves and say, why couldn't you have done this? Why didn't you buy Bitcoin at 18? Right. You know, why didn't you buy Bitcoin at 18? I, I w- I'm writing this course. It's kind of in my head right now because I, I'm ri- I write courses to help people in prison understand how to think differently and how to be thinking about how are you going to emerge as a law-abiding contributing citizen? And it's very easy to live in prison as a victim and and not look at yourself and say, how did I get here? Or what can I do to make things better? It's hard to stay self-directed and self-motivated. And I write about, you know, how I had to learn about tech while I was in prison. You know, I I, I didn't touch a keyboard. I, I'd never, I used to dream about what the internet is, but I had a website and I was publishing every day from prison in 1999 and building a support system and building a network and doing whatever I could. And right now I'm creating this course on crypto because I'm saying I really missed something because I got out of prison on, in August of 2012. I transitioned from prison to a halfway house. And at that time, I'm writing in this course to help people understand DeFi and decentralized finance and crypto. And, and because I'm saying you need to learn this. If you do not understand this now, you will not be you will be in a weaker position when you come home. Mm-hmm. Sure. And you have to learn. And you have to learn about decentralized finance and you have to learn about artificial intelligence. These are the two biggest things happening in the world right now and there's no reason you can't learn because I guarantee you the guy that's pumping that owns four gas stations, he does not invest in learning about open intel and artificial intelligence. And he doesn't want to. He he's already okay. He's making 300 a year and you know, he's comfortable with his life, but if you could go into him and show him and say, "Hey, let me build this for you and I can take your four gas stations into 15 and this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to get there and I just want a piece, you know, and just let me do this, right? And you can motivate somebody to do that." I said, "Then you've created your own job and nobody cares that you have tattoos on your face or your your you got 17 felonies. They just care can you bring value." Yeah. So this is the time to learn. And even if you can't access a computer, you can learn by reading. Learn the vocabulary. Learn how people are using it. And all you're going to do is accelerate your pathway to success. So I try to teach that to people. And I had to give this analogy. I said, I didn't, I learned a lot while I was in prison, but I didn't learn about crypto. And, and it started in 2009, 10. And I said, in 2012, when I got out, the price of a coin was $13. That was the highest price of a Bitcoin when I transitioned. I said, so if somebody had $1,000, just do the math, he said, you could have bought 76 Bitcoins. Today, that's worth $4 million. (laughs) $1,000 is worth $4 million in 10 years. And I'm not saying there aren't, those opportunities exist right now. The question is, are you investing in yourself in such a way that you can seize those? And that's what I had to learn how to do in prison. And that's, uh, I remember when we had our first discussion, that was one of the things we sort of landed on was the, the entrepreneurial world for someone that went through a situation like yours or anyone that's in prison is probably one of the best paths that's available because 
you know, corporate America is going to look at most people and say, nope, nope, no, nope. you don't even get an interview. It's just nope, nope, nope. So like you, you know, someone that's looking at you and following you and watching you and saying, okay, so this is, this, this is all about me putting effort into myself to make whatever value I have stronger and noticeable. And then, like you said, people don't care about is it, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, it's like, what, what results can you produce for me? Not, you know, where are you in prison or where you went to school or any of the other things that people ask in a, in a regular work world? Yes. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of people that live with the, with the, with the entitlement mentality. Yeah. And then they've got an excuse. It's not my fault. You know, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not, nobody gives who <laughs> cares whose fault it is. Can you bring value to the marketplace? Right. And if you can do that, then it doesn't matter. You know, nobody cares. And and so you try to try to emulate people that are that have that mindset. And I mean, I don't tell you, I've met a lot of people outside that were in a way bigger prison than I've ever been in. And they've been home their whole time. It's just the the prison of their mind and how they, they create think. their own prison. and 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 what they the excuses are unbelievable, you know, that, that people have. Mm. It's just um that's something you can't have and, and emerge to, successfully from prison there is an alternative and uh, you know there's a lot of homeless camps that need new people and that's what i tell people when i go to prison a lot of homeless camp waiting for you out here don't worry about that but if you want mm. something different you better think differently and so let's um let's that's a i'm glad you drew that um people create their own prisons and yeah put themselves in it and that must drive you crazy when you run into people like that who say uh either well, say the oh, thing you're about so it is i i this. i imagine the the complexity of my work. I was in prison for 26 years and I create pathways for people in prison to succeed and hopefully to get out earlier. Mm -hmm. And I have um, enormous adversaries from the people that work in prisons who don't want that. You know, they, they don't want people to come back successfully. Many, many people don't and they object to it and they tell me, they flat out, I don't think you should be letting people out early. You know, they, they should do 20. And here's the irony. And I tell them this. I was as ready to come home after eight years as I ever would be. At eight years, I was 32 years old, right? I went at 23. I was like, yeah, 30, something like that. Maybe 30, I would have been 20, 30, 31, somewhere in there. I had mm -hmm. a master's degree. I was an author. I was young. And I was as ready as I could ever be, ever. But I had to do another 16 years at a cost of, or 18 years, because I did 26 years. I had to do 18 more years at a cost of, what, 35 grand a year? And all that money, for what? Did I learn? Was I supposed to learn something? Was I, I didn't feel as if I was being punished. I mean, it was my life. It was where I was. That was just life. You know, there comes a time where you have to figure out, are we doing the right thing? Is it is it is it important for somebody, you know, is is society going to be better off putting somebody in prison for seven years or 17 years? There comes a point where it doesn't make any sense anymore. Because right. the guy I used to I'm in prison, I go, why, why am I here again? I don't remember. <laughs> I came in so young and now I'm, you know, I'm almost 50. And it was the here was the weirdest thing. When I was in for like 20 years and I went to minimum security camps or so. And every day I would get in a vehicle with a key and drive on the highway at midnight. That was my job. And, and I'm saying, I'm out here driving in society and I got to drive back to the prison. I don't even understand this. What, what is the sense of this? And all it's doing, you know, I became financially successful, but other people don't. And all that I'm doing is creating this intergenerational cycle of failure because this guy's not preparing for retirement, which means he's going to be a burden on society. He's not owning property or assets. He is making himself less likely to function. He doesn't understand how to work in uh, an evolving society. And there's a very good chance he's going back to prison because he won't function out here. And statistics show that. Those aren't my words. That's their statistics. And it just, it is absurd the way that we run our nation's system. In my view, we should be focusing on result. What do we want? We want people to emerge as law-abiding, tax-paying, contributing citizens. Well, if that's what we want, we need to change the system. What needs to change? What would you do? 
I would make it like America, right? What is America? Hard work, you earn higher levels of liberty, a better quality of life through merit, a merit-based system. To, To measure justice through the turning of calendar pages serves nobody's interest except the ecosystem of prison. Okay. It's it's a multi it's a hundred billion dollar a year industry that perpetuates intergenerational cycles of failure. And that's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And if we were to say, let's measure results instead of um this antiquated concept of of um justice is turned by calendar pages. No. Justice, what that does, too many calendar pages results in increased recidivism rates and less safe communities. If we want safer communities, we have got to rethink it and make it more like America. How do you succeed in America? You develop value. You get a better education. You find a way to create opportunities. You create jobs. You contribute uh, to your church or your synagogue or to your mosque. You volunteer. You do good. Mm-hmm. And life gets better, okay? I would say if you're if you if you take a guy that's going to prison for ten years or fifteen years, what would you rather have? The guy do fifteen years and have zero skills and come back at thirteen years, okay, and have no capacity to function, to become a homeowner, to own assets, to prepare for his own retirement, or say, wow. This guy earned a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, published this, did this or that. He's ready to come home at six. And the guy should be working toward that six. Right. So incentive-based you pursuing something to work. excellence, yeah. Yeah. right? That's what society is. Aren't you a private equity guy? And that uh, right? I have some private equity. I'm not so, a, so, a, I don't have a fund or anything. But, but just think about biz dev, right? Yeah. Biz dev, right? I invest in success. And I want to see, I'm going to reward. If I got a sales guy and he's crushing it, he's going to get paid more. You know, <laughs> that, he's earned more, right? I mean, that's just the world. But America is as close as we come in this, in the United States, as close as we come to communism is in a prison. Because in a prison, you take away the value of private property. You take away the value of the individual. You put the state above the individual. You tell a person where he's going to eat, where he's going to sleep, what books he can read, what what uh, people he can associate with. And that's that's not America. And that doesn't position somebody for success in America. And it leads to, I think statistics show, intergenerational cycles of failure. So you know, I'm on a ministry to change that. And that's that's um, that's something I feel very passionately about is changing the system so that we would incentivize excellence and have people work toward earning freedom. And how about the people you work with directly, Michael? So on the, that's sort of the policy side, but what about, I know you work with, you, you help get people ready to go. Um, well, we have a company prison. that does that. Yeah. I don't personally do that anymore. Okay. I hire okay. people that are formerly incarcerated that have gone through my programs and they become, um, you know, coaches or mentors or consultants, and they assist in areas that an attorney cannot assist. So if you're a non-criminogenic person, you really don't know how to develop a mitigation strategy. And it's super important to do that. So we have a company that does that. My area is on the nonprofit side. Okay. That's really where I focus on, um, you know, trying to change the system at scale and helping people inside understand what they can do to help themselves. I mean, it really takes a big ecosystem to change all this. Oh yeah. Well, a hundred billion dollar. Yeah. Uh, industry there's a lot of vested, there's a lot of people with a vested ingrained. interest in keeping it going. Yeah. And there's a lot of people on the outside who don't really understand the dynamics on the inside, sort of like the professor at Princeton that you were talking about, you know, let them yeah. rot, right. They, they yeah, just, he, re- he, he's turned out to be a, um, you know, I, I'm a bigger advocate for these changes that I, yeah. that I we're in alignment now in that regard. You mentioned getting married in prison. And I think that may have happened 10 years before you got out. 10 something. years before I got yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. Which is interesting because you were, you know, you were saying, uh, reflecting, like I got 16 years left here and I don't know, you know, I kind of don't know why, how, well, first of all, how do you, how do you go about getting married in prison, Michael? And what did that do for you for the remaining time that you were there? And 
you know, so to get you I, ready I, afterwards. I think, I think as human beings, you know, we all have to be connected. And uh, I, I, by the time Carol's, I met Carol, you know, I had been an author and was publishing a lot. And so people were reading about me. And this was at the start of the internet. So people started to research who I am. And they, and through that research is how Carol came into my life. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we developed a correspondence and, you know, friendship. And then she came to visit me after like 10 months. We fell in love in a visiting room in prison. And um, we got married after like a year or so. In, and, and that was when I was in my 16th year of imprisonment. So I had 10 more years to go. And uh, yeah, it was great. She became, I, I was earning money in prison. <laughs> I'd launched these businesses in prison and I was earning money. So I was able to support her. Um, and she became a nurse. And uh, she went through the whole process of visiting me, transferring wherever I got transferred. And she went to, became a CNA and then an, uh, a certified nurse's aide. Then what's next? A licensed vocational nurse, then a registered nurse. Then she got her master's in nursing. Then I got out. And she became a nursing professor and she was a nurse and a nursing professor. And, and it was always a plan that someday we'd get strong enough where she could just work together with me. And that's what we do now. So now she's, she no longer is a practicing nurse. She works with me full time, but we've mm -hmm. been married for 20. It'll be our, uh, well, we got married in 2003. So it'll be our 21st year this June. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Happy well, Valentine's day too, by the way, yeah, We're doing this yeah. on Valentine's day. <laughs> huh. yeah. So happy Valentine's Day to you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And did I read somewhere that you you and she knew each other in grade school or something? And that's the funny thing. So that's how we met. So we okay. grew up in we grew up, but she had the good sense to stay away from me because I was a pretty wild kid when I was a God, she was a good girl. So we were not friends in school, but we did go to school together. And that's how we connected. She was coordinating the 20 year reunion for our high school. And some student, I don't even know who it is, we don't know who it is, had read my work. And he was researching me on the internet. And he found that high school. And she, he just wrote an unsolicited letter and said, is this the same high school, Shortcrest, where Michael Santos went to school? And she was the one who got the letter because she was coordinating the reunion. And she said, yeah, why, why are you asking? And the guy said, well, he's in prison. <laughs> and And that prompted Carol to write me a letter about how awful it was that I was a drug dealer. <laughs> that's, that's how it started. So she that's wasn't how like, it started. Oh, okay. She, she was telling me, you know, I'm a mother of two kids and drugs are so bad. And you were always kind of a wild kid. And I can't believe you did that. And now you're in prison. And, but by the way, we're having a 20 year reunion. And if you want me to send you some pictures, I will. <laughs> and that's how it started. And, and I wrote it back. I said, yeah, I made a lot of bad decisions, but you know, I'm not 20 anymore. I'm 35. And, and uh, you know, we, it started a correspondence and I've been very lucky because of that. Yeah. you Yeah. It sounds, that's the one part that does sound lucky. Of, oh, of, it, you know, I, she, I'll say I engineered it because mm -hmm. like, I'll even ask her, I said, why do you think we're married? And she said, well, because, you know, um, I, I wrote to you and I said, no, reverse that. How did you write to me? Well, that kid wrote to me. Yeah, but why did that kid write to you? Because I did all these books. All that was engineered. I was in prison and I said, I've got to figure out a way to transcend these walls yeah. and get people to see me not for the bad decisions that I made, but rather for what I'm going to become. In order to do that, I'd better get an education. And because if I can get an education, then I can perhaps become a better writer. If I can become a better writer more people will learn about me. And if I, more people learn about me, some of those people will become my friend. And if people, become, I mean, it was all these connections. And that's what's super important to look back and say, well, I think as your first connection, how did you get here? Right. Well, all of that is, is like an on, it's not a one-time thing. It's a everyday thing. Okay. And every day we should be saying, well, if I could look back and say, well, how it got me here, what could I look forward and say, what can I create? You know, like right now, we've spoken about crypto, or artificial intelligence and crypto. And I said, well, if I could learn about those things, will I be more valuable or less valuable in the future? And, you know, I invest in that. I invest in the future and I invest in myself. And that's what I would encourage anybody to do. 
and then opportunities open and then everybody else can say, well, look at how lucky he was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> while they're while they stand in the shallow water yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, well it's not my fault you know he got lucky <laughs> so um so let's so let's end up here I, I most of my listeners are entrepreneurs business owners not people who've had uh spend any time in prison so you know you talked about the prison reform you've talked about the life in there you've talked about the, the life out of there which is most super you know exciting as well what do you want to leave people with? What should they know about you, about your work, about what they can be doing to educate themselves, whatever? What what, what do you want to leave people with? You know, I just want to thank you. You know, I, I want to start with gratitude and just say thank you, Mike, for allowing me to communicate with your listeners. And, you know, hopefully they are living their best life and 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 living in gratitude every day and always pursuing what's important to them. I don't know that what's important to me is even is relevant at all. Mm. Um, we all have our path. You know, I um run a, a nonprofit that I'm that I'm grateful to to be able to influence and make an impact on the lives of people in prison, but I don't think that's everybody's pursuit, you know. There's a lot of people that that don't care about people in prison and 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 and, and that's fine. My it's something that's in important to me and I'm in a position that 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 I get to, you know, it's fortunate for me I get to try and change people's minds and help people see a better way. You know, what, what I tell people that are in the system, I said the one great thing right now is that regardless of what side of the political spectrum on, you have something in common with people in power because at the Trump family right now, they are thinking about well, what if things don't go right and there's a prison cell in my future? They are mm. thinking about that right now. There's no way they're not in the Biden family right now with their son under indictment, they are thinking, well, what's going to happen if we have to visit him in prison? You cannot right. be under indictment and not have this massive crisis going on in your life. And, 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 and I like that. <laughs> I like that because it, it, it makes it more plausible for people to see if they can get them, they can get anybody. And you've got a lot of entrepreneurs right now who don't, who I have zero doubt that they are doing some things right now that a prosecutor could look at and say, I wonder if I could increase my resume by bringing that guy in. Yeah. And, and, and that could lead to, and you, did he really sign every form? Did he, what was his intent here? What happened here? Did he mislead somebody with that marketing piece? Right. There are so many ways that people should be thinking today about the possible you know, in an era of big government, there are going to be more investigations and every business leader should be thinking about, have I done everything to protect myself? Maybe I should learn something. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and so, yeah, if this conversation gets people to, to ask those kinds of questions, the one thing I will say is that every person in prison believes that there was a time that they would never go to prison. But I can tell you that the president um, is thinking, not thinking about that with his son and the former president is definitely thinking about that. And maybe he's going to come in and gut the system. I don't know, yeah. but I know my job is to help people succeed regardless of what other people do. Well, I thank you for shit, for, for leading that with us. I, I call that like gray line thinking, you know, so it's sort of like you, when you first got into what you were doing, it's like, what? I'm just, it's not, yeah. you know, I and, said the asset's worth 10 million. And, you know, who's going to know? It's up to me. It's what the next guy will pay for it, you know? Well, <laughs> I mean, right. Yeah. I said, well, my, I said my building's worth 30,000 square feet. So it's only yeah. 10,000 square feet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what? Yeah. Well, but, yes. But yes, apply that to a lot of people. And sales. You can, there are yeah. so many sales and marketing people that don't even realize how prosecutors are looking at it from a very different lens than they are. And yeah. uh, that is a. Uh, I mean, big government, in my view, is really bad. And we, we should be, as Americans, be looking at fixing it. Okay. We're going to leave it at that. Michael Santos, right. thank you so much for coming on the show. Visit Michael's website to learn more, michaelsantos.com. And thank well, it's you. really prisonprofessors.com. Oh, I mean, there's so many websites. If you just Googled Michael Santos, I'm like every everything that comes up. So there's a ton of stuff there. But okay. I just want to thank you, Mike, for giving me this opportunity. And you agreed to reciprocate. And I could take your I amazing did. story into jails and prisons. <laughs> I would love to be on your show. So let's do that as soon as we can. Thank you. 
Thank you, Michael. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the show. And before you go, I just have three requests for you. One, if you like what I'm doing, please consider subscribing or following the podcast on whatever podcast platform you prefer. If you're really into it, leave me a review, write something nice about me, give me five stars or whatever you feel is most appropriate. Number two, I've got a book. It's called Ownership, How Getting Selfish Got Me Unstuck. It's an Amazon bestseller. And I'd love for you to read it or listen to it on Audible or wherever else, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. You can get it everywhere. If you're looking for inspiration that will help you unlock your greatness and potential, order or download it today so that you can have your very own copy. And if you get it, please let me know what you think. Number three, my newsletter. I do a newsletter every Thursday and I talk about things that are interesting to me and or I give more information about the podcast and the podcast guests that I've had and the experiences that I've had with them. You can sign up for the podcast today at my website, which is my name, MikeMalatesta.com. You do that right now, put in your email address and you'll get the very next issue. The newsletter is short, thoughtful, and designed to inspire, activate, and maximize the greatness in you.